but she is up right now. So you have me for a second. I We are always happy to have our speakers for our DEI lecture series. We've partnered with a bunch of different departments in our college. Um, the last one that we did, it was amazing. It was for Black History Month and we partnered with one of our students, the Black Creatives Club. And we had a bunch of amazing Black creatives speak to us about their journey and their experience as Black creatives in the art and design industry. And today we have some other amazing creatives coming here to speak to us about their experience as people in the fashion industry. And we have our amazing chair, Aki, who is going to be our moderator today. And Aki, you can take it away. Super, thank you so much uh, for that wonderful um, introduction. And welcome everybody for this uh, webinar. I'm in a very, very honorable uh, company, people that I really admire. We have uh, voices from every level of the industry and also a student voice. So I know this topic is um, huge in scope. Um, however, with this panel, we will try to answer some of those burning questions about race, gender and body. We are hoping uh, with the conversation to inspire and provide positive points of views for the future of our industry. Our distinguished panelists today are Edmundo Castillo, world-renowned shoe designer and the head of design at Stuart Weitzman. Uh, Ken Walker, a Detroit native menswear designer, and I'm a client and I love his uh, collections. Shauna McKee, brand new friend, uh, adorable, a wonderful designer, uh, one of the founding members of Maison Black as well, Maison Black Collective, and also a fantastic illustrator. Uh, Michigan native Caleb Brian Wells, um, specializing in genderless clothing uh, and uh, founder of uh, their label. And congratulations uh, being selected to show in Paris this fall. So hopefully this uh, panel will uh, give you a little extra help in uh, as a young designer to get, get to Paris, you know, so that you can, won't, won't regret that. Furthermore, we also have a student voice represented by Nikki Park, who is currently a junior in our fashion program and the founder of her label, uh, Query Park. And also to be working with Edmundo Castillo in New York uh, shortly. So we're very, like the circle is full. So let's just go straight into the topic. And I have divided the webinar into five questions. I have a question for each, each panelist. And I will start with um, Shana. And my question to you is, has the industry changed in the past year to a better, or do you think there are still problems? You had a very strong public point of view of the recent Ralph Lauren advertising campaign, but maybe you can talk about a little bit about your journey. You were in a fashion capital of New York for the past quite a few years. So has it changed? Well, I started in the industry uh, after I graduated from Parsons in 82. And uh, my first job was at Ann Klein under Donna Karen and Louis Delolio. And that team was actually very diverse. But between then and now, there hasn't been a whole lot of change in between. When I was at Maggie London, that was a pretty diverse team. But overall, there hasn't been a lot of diversity uh, in the industry. Not as much change as I would have liked to have seen. I think I've seen more with models than I have with the actual design team itself. Okay. Um, that still has stayed pretty protected, you know, mm. and it, uh, you know, inclusive, you could say, um, within the industry. So do I think things are changing? I do think things are changing. I think that things are changing for the better, but it's still a very slow process. Um, I think during the George Floyd murders, there were a lot of uh, different groups that came up that um, decided to uh, actually call out the issue with the CFDA and different organizations. And so they are definitely trying to make efforts to make it better. Um, but like I said, it hasn't been a tremendous change, but I think I, I, I see, a, I feel like I've see a light at the end of the tunnel because there are more black designers who are starting to get um, into retailers that they never could have gotten into before. Uh, so I'm happy to see that. And I'm one of those designers who will be going into the retail market soon. So I'm excited about that. And yeah. Great. So 
I, 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 I follow you obviously on social media and you had a very mm. strong point of view about um, the Ralph Lauren campaign. Uh, do, do you want to? Uh... The HBCU campaign. So I'll start with the fact that I, I'll start with the fact that it did bring a lot of attention to HBCUs because a lot of people didn't even know that they existed. So that was really good. I love the fact that he uh, gave funds to the schools, you know, to help them um, and the team that worked on it. So there were some positive things about it. Um, my opinion was, and certain other friends of mine, in my mostly from my age group, honestly, um, it didn't look so current to me. It kind of gave you a feeling of the movie Selma in a way, in the sense that it, it was beautiful, but for some of us, it just brought up certain times that we didn't want to really be reminded of. It didn't look as modern, even though I think that that young man who did it the photographs were beautiful. Some of the tailoring was beautiful on the men. And I felt that maybe it should have, do kids want to look that way today? The way they portrayed it. Do kids really want to look that way? And I'm not, not saying the kids need to have their pants down below their butts either, but there was, to me, could there have been something where you give homage to the past but also bring it forward, but maybe have had it have have had some looks with kids. How would they would actually look today wearing those clothes? Maybe you have the tweed, beautifully tweed jacket with a great pair of denim pants or something. You know, there, maybe there was a way you could have um, brought it forward. Okay. I agree. Go ahead. Do you, you know, have um, other other do other panelists have an opinion about that as well? Yeah, I thought yeah, it was. I thought... Oh, go ahead. Sorry, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no worries. Uh, I just, uh, I think, to piggyback on what you were saying, um, the intention was there. Um, mm -hmm. I think the execution was where they could have, because they they do have a pretty diverse, I think, team there where he could have got inside of Ron. Like, what are college students going to those schools wearing? You know, now and, today. Yeah, like you know, because you could get actual students. Um, to actually inform the collection, which is inclusive, but also we know that this is a fashion house that is, you know, boundless. Like they can kind of go in any direction. He can make more graphic tees, he can make hoodies, he can make a lot of different things. But college students today, you know, they they want to show homage to those schools and the heritage. But we know that um, typically that, uh, you know, Nike does like a great job of like kind of honoring those schools with the school colors. But him as a luxury brand, I think it was just kind of maybe something that they were trying to bring forth to the in the current world. But I do think that the creative did come across very, you know, a little more historic versus more, you know, timely as well. One thing I must say though, when you said that they had had diverse team. I've worked at Ralph Lauren, I've worked at Ralph Lauren Sleepwear and I freelanced there many years ago with collection. And his company really isn't that, wasn't that diverse before for many years. And I mean, it was not, you know, it wasn't diverse at all. So I'm happy to hear that it is getting more diverse in, in time. Edmundo, you uh, wanted to say something. Edmundo wanted to say something. No, I, I did work there also um, back in the 90s. And mm. um, I, it, it, at least in the design studio, the design studio was, was somewhat, somewhat diverse. I, I, but I, I came from 10 years at Donna Karen before that where it was really, really diverse. Exactly. Um, where, where I was surprised was how disconnected the clothes were to today, even though it was showing something that is, um, you know, that, that, that it was trying to show diversity and all of that that we saw, but somehow the clothes didn't belong to to the subject, mm -hmm. which is life today, you know, it, it felt customy to me. It looked mm -hmm. like no one who dresses like that. It was 
the first thing that I thought when I when I saw it, I was like, well, who, who wants to look like this today? Like, mm -hmm. what's the message? It felt completely disconnected to reality. Great. So, El Mundo, since you are on the phone <laughs> right now, <laughs> the second question is to you. Um, you are possibly in the, well, I shouldn't say possibly, you are in the most important footwear position in the world. I mean, you are head of design at Stuart Weitzman. And what advice would you give to a young Latin dreamer that reads the stars like you have? Um, well, you know, <laughs> dreaming is free. You don't have to pay to dream. You know, that is the most beautiful thing is to dream and to, and as you dream to be, um, you know, to, to, to also be realistic about what is it that you're dreaming about? Because, you know, there is dreams and there is dreams. There are dreams that you want to conquer. There are dreams that are just, you know, the fantasy and the dream. But, you know, it, 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 it's, a, it's an industry where you have to work very hard. You know, it's not this idea of the fashion industry being, being um, about glamour. You know, the glamour is for who wears it not for who creates it but nevertheless you know is is a lot of fun to be to to be able to 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 create all these things and to put product out there for for everybody um i think that um you know it it's it, i i i didn't set myself a goal that was you know, in 30 years, I want to be doing this. You know, I've been doing this for 32 years right now. But I wasn't thinking about the 32 years. I was thinking more about like the next year. What is it that I want to accomplish from this year to the next year? And like that, go and you escalate little by little by little by little going, you know, <clears throat> adjusting your dream according to your surroundings and to your responsibilities and to... The, the, the things that you want to be noticed for and grow within your industry. But um, it's, it's about dreaming and feeling good about your dream and feeling positive that you can make it. And more than anything, work hard, 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 because working hard is what gets you to places. Thank you, Edmundo. So Nikki, let's go to Nikki next. So what is your opinion of Asian <laughs> representation in fashion today? I mean, it's been a lot in media in the past few years, and I know we discussed it uh, before. So tell us. Um, I think um, to specify the question, when it comes to Asian fashion, I think um, Asian people, we actually specify more on the stylistic part of fashion. We actually use fashion as a tool, most likely to show not just what we wear, what we do, what type of lifestyle we have, what type of cultural background we have. That is all encapsulated into style. But nowadays, some one designer that really does stand out um, for Asian representation nowadays is Philip Lim. Um, in New York right now, especially in Chinatown. And as I know you guys hear in the news, there's a lot of um, downfall within the Asian community in New York. And on top of that, in Chinatown, they have um, started building an $8.3 billion um, tallest prison in the country, right in, in Chinatown. So because of that, I think, I believe that um, Philip Lim especially did start um, having an AAPI um, Stop Asian Hate um, community. And I think that is actually the biggest start for the Asian community so far. Um, we do have a tendency of not being able to speak up, not being able to express our true feelings just because of our very respectful culture. However, um, I think um, starting from last year and starting from all this um, violence and and just sadness. I think a lot of people are trying to do something about it finally. And I'm, I'm really hopeful for our community to not only just to be representation, representing our culture, but also to learn from other cultures and incorporating everything that should be in fashion and 
in the industry. Um, sometimes I feel like there are two categorized, if that makes any sense, with stylistic approaches or even um, references from the past. But I think as people of color, we should we should be open to working together. We should be opening open to listening to other people's history and cultures. Because at the end of the day, it just makes our minds even broader. And, and that ultimately, I think, is something that is important to be a designer or an artist is to have that good foundation of morals, mm -hmm. ethics, and whatever you are, you stand for. Um, but it really does help to define it when you are surrounded by different types of backgrounds and people and people who have completely different lives with you. Um, yeah. <laughs> Wow, I, I vote for Nikki. <laughs> <laughs> so does anybody I, have any I voted already for Nikki. Oh, <laughs> you you. <laughs> so do you have yeah, any uh, comments uh, about? Did you say that they they're building the tallest prison in tallest China? prison in the country? Eight point wow. three billion dollars of taxpayers' money for the biggest. It's just and it's all privatized. That's the biggest problem. These people are making money off of prisoners by, by one person, this one private company that owns all these um, homeless shelters, um, owns all these um, prison cells. It's all capitalism. But however, I don't think we can say like, let's be anti-capitalistic. Let's, let's break this down. We have, to, we have to slowly start changing people's mindsets, I think. And unfortunately, it really took this big of a, I would say, subsidized building for the whole community to get really, really in. Uh oh, super, okay. I think we heard the last bit, he was frozen a little bit. Great, so Ken. Hello, Ken. Hi, how are you? Good. <laughs> So you have a very exciting news. You are opening um, a brick and mortar store in Detroit, June 11th, I believe is the opening. That's right. So what message would you, I'm really about messaging, what message would you have for a young black designer to reach the point where you are right now and be able to do something as amazing as opening your own namesake store? Yeah, I always say, um, always find the why behind what you're doing when you're starting off because the passion can only take you so far. Um, but also black designers um, for so long have been ignored or even just not giving the resources that they need to thrive. Um, some of these dreams become deferred because we're not um, in places where that skill set can be grown, um, or we're not just around people where it seems attainable. You know, we're used to looking at the Grammys and seeing, you know, a great designs or artists that we look up to start brands. But um, for me, it was all about believing in myself and just being resourceful. You know, so a lot of the things that I did when I launched was I used what I had. You know, and at the point when I got to high school when I was 15, I remember. I had that vision of having this store, you know, and this brand. And I went to college, you know, not having a actual fashion design background. I went to college and still was kind of lost on like what my professional life would be like, because I didn't um, connect it to, you know, and, you know, being in fashion, it didn't seem attainable as a job that I could have. Um, but it, it came full circle for me, you know, because I got my degree and marketing and started a career in marketing, which helped me position what I was doing. Um, so I always tell you know anyone of color who is trying to start something, um, I believe we have such a pulse on culture naturally. Um, you know, I think there's always a sense of like, you know, we're more cognizant to kind of look at what people are wearing. We ask a lot of questions. Um, those are natural instincts as a creative that you should have as a designer. Um, but also when it comes to being resourceful, um, knowing that these resources aren't as attainable or in our reach, you don't know how far a conversation can go when you're telling someone about what you're doing and how they can help you. Um, and that was something that um, I, I started to do, you know, because I was once that person that would just keep it all to myself, keep it in my head, go in my dorm room and sketch and make designs and, you know, but not tell anyone about it. 
So when I um, grew in my career in marketing, um, it was actually at my first agency job where I told one of my coworkers my vision and she did my branding. You know, she was like, well, how about I help you with your logo? And I was like, what? You know, so that was in a conversation, you know, and then that logo turned to me then doing a fashion show in 2019 and then going to New York Fashion Week. And now um, to be opening in a store uh, only two blocks down from that same high school, you know, is full circle for me. But it was all about the relationships that I built. And I think sometimes as creatives, we um, we keep it to ourselves, but we don't realize that the community and those connections are, are what's going to kind of build that blueprint for your success. Hmm. I, I remember you telling me that um, in another event where we were together that it was easier for you to get help opening a brick and mortar as opposed to like a web shop or something like that. Did I hear that right? Or Yeah. So like what the, um, what I had learned when I was uh, predominantly online for like the last five years um, was the experience that people expect um, before they make a purchase decision. And when I came out the gate as a menswear brand, uh, 80% of my sales came from women. <laughs> so it wasn't, wasn't this core audience I was looking at. And um, I would just worry. I'm like, wait, so my vision isn't valid anymore. Um, but women really are the trendsetters in fashion. And I started to listen to those consumers because they not only were buying stuff for themselves because they wanted more gender neutral designs, but sometimes they were buying clothing for the men, men in their lives. Um, so when I was uh, going through um, the last two years of just kind of making more gender neutral designs and color palettes, um, I started to learn when I did pop up shops and events, my sales were higher. Um, so Detroit is the new black. Um, I was in there for two years. I had a like section in a store and I always had consistent sales. So for me, it was I saw that, you know, some brands do thrive, you know, as a digital in a digital brand and a lot of brands of color, you know, Hanifa. Um, you know, Brandon Blackwood, like all of these different brands are killing it in the digital space. But some brands like myself, it's to be experienced. And, you know, I love fashion shows. I love curating something to make someone feel um, more something but serial with the whole brand as well. So for me, that was um, my indication to go brick and mortar. But when I started to talk about that with people here in Detroit, I learned about Tech Town, which is an incubator that will give you those resources. So I did the retail boot camp that gave me a grant that helped me find a space. And now I still have a coach that guides me along the process because it comes with a lot more work, but also to see it before my eyes is kind of just like, you know, full circle for me as well. Great. So speaking of gender and gender neutral clothing, uh, Caleb, it's your turn. So, Caleb, you're probably in the hottest space in fashion at the moment, uh, really pioneering ideas of uh, genderless fashion, um, queer, POC owned. What has the reaction been? And I already know the answer, but I want to hear it from your, your, uh, your words. Well, the reaction really has been like overwhelmingly positive. Um, people seem to be really interested in you know, kind of stepping away from those old ideologies and way of living um, into kind of a freer mindset. And I think that um, with my brand, because we kind of float in and out of spaces um, between more like evening and streetwear, I want to be like all encompassing for all the different people um, in in fashion, like looking for gender neutral um, clothing. But it's been it's been really really positive so far. Okay, so can you tell a little bit about your history? Um, you are a young, new, new, newer, newer brand. So how, like, was this a decision that you already made when you were studying? Or was it something that sort of like clicked when you were draping? Is it something personal? Yeah, so I started fashion when I was 11. I knew, I was like, this is what I want to do. Um, and, you know, as as I was growing up and developing my skills, like I, I didn't really know exactly what I wanted to do, but I know I loved making clothes and I'm just gonna stick with it. And that kind of carried out um, in my earlier years of college. I was like, I just, you know, I'm still experimenting and like, I'm still trying to find my own like technique and different things. And I feel like throughout time, 
I kind of started to mesh and through the different um, internships I did, I did three internships, all drastically different from each other, but um, having those different exposures to different parts of the, the fashion industry was really, really formative, uh, formative, formative for me. And it was just like when I went to London, it was a completely different space than I had ever been introduced to. Um, so I think that really like having those having those experiences and everything have just been really been amazing and it's taken me in a direction that I, I really had no idea I was going to go into I thought I was going to go more into retail because that's what you know people make money and like else what designers do and then I went over to London and I was like oh this is I can do you know more small scale and it can still be really productive and get as much reach as some, you know, mass productions. So I I knew that I loved making clothes and that was my passion. So trying to go into more of a tailored, small, sustainable brand. Um, yeah, it was just, it was really formative, formative um, with those experiences and the different spaces. So. Oh, great. So Edmundo, yes. let's talk about gender. Because uh, you are, I mean, Stuart Weitzman is primarily a women's wear brand. So how how do you navigate this new new era, or, or maybe not so new? I mean, men wore heels, you know, in the 1700s and before that. So how do how do we navigate this new 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 need? Well, funny enough, um, when I had my store back in. 2002 um, in Olita in New York, I came to find out that I had a lot of male clients um, that were um, nothing like what I was expected, expecting to have as a as a, as male clients buying the type of shoes that I was that I was making. And I always felt that shoes are such an emotional piece of your wardrobe that um, I always like to keep men and women alike in mind when I design. But that, that was something that I was doing as a result of that, this fascination that I have with shoes and, and how much of a of a manipulative accessory shoes can be um, and the fantasies that can be lived through shoes. So when I came to Stuart Weissman, I came to find out as well that we had a lot of male clientele because we had a lot of extended sizes. And right now we have a lot of male salespeople in our stores that wear a lot of our shoes, the shoes that we sell. So I have approached in the last few years um, designing certain shoes in a way that both men and women can wear. Um, and, and at the same time, the, 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 you know, keeping the, the, the size, the, you know, we, we offer from size four to size 13. And we offer extended sizes also in boot shaft. And we, so we have created this world of, 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 of genderless shoes without, um, without um, you know, in a very natural way. It is being kind of like on plan to, to, to just fit anybody that has the desire to buy one of our shoes, whether it's men, women, you know, any shape, size, I mean, anything. Because, you know, shoes, Shoes are that thing that I think that touch people in a different way. The desire for a particular shoe is is approached very differently than than in than other accessories. Mm. Great, thank you, Edmundo. Nikki, I have a question for you. I know that um, I, I'm always very conscious of saying like, oh, in Asia, I mean, it is a huge continent of different cultures of various kinds of nuances. So I hate to kind of like put it all under one umbrella, but um, 
in let's talk about for example south korea and of course you know the world of k-pop has taken over the world so what's the your, your gender take on uh, in that kind of a world mm. so this is it might be confusing to explain um let's try <laughs> um so you, as you can see visually these k-pop boy bands visually they look feminine they have makeup on they do all these addition and accessories that more relate to female but culturally we're one of the worst place for um lgbtq people um so there's like a weird dichotomy between it because we celebrate men almost looking prettier than women but at the same time when it comes to their sexuality um it the world is just not there so it actually is a really difficult wall to break because visually we're so used to um, seeing more the mixture of genders, but in reality, no one is actually identifying themselves. So I do see more and more K-pop or more celebrities in Korea actually coming out, um, being open about their identity. And I think that is actually, it has to be the first step within the Korean culture, because unfortunately, entertainment, I mean, it, it relates here to entertainment and media is just the number one influence that has on especially young people. So you can definitely see, especially the Gen Z um, South Koreans in TikTok, they're actually more open about their identity. However, I think we're still waiting on a time where it comes from the top down. Um, yeah, we're just waiting on the time, I would say. It's taking a while. Okay. Well, there's one thing, and this is a sort of a broader question to the whole panel. Uh, there's one, one uh, diversity-related question that I haven't really asked, and it is about the body and the body shape. Um, there's been a huge changes in that as well uh, recently. Anybody wants to muse about that? I feel like Caleb I, wants to say something. Go ahead, Shana, go. I think Thank it's you, about Caleb. time, you know, that we've embraced different, you know, body sizes and everything. You know, um, I honestly think that a lot of the models since I have started have gotten too skinny. They're they're way too emaciated. They're like a zero, zero, two to size two or something. So I think it's great to, if, whatever you are, I think it's great if you're full size or if you're really thin, we need to embrace our body types as a whole period and yeah. accept all, everyone is beautiful. You know what I mean? That's how I feel, especially in the United States because we're, we're a, uh, our sizes are bigger. I think we're average woman is like 12, 14, somewhere in there. So that's just how I feel. And all our dress forms are um, recommended to be six. And, yeah, uh, we do our eight. fittings on a six. Yeah, and we, we ordered eight, which is like normal. And someone's like, oh, this is so big. It's like, well, what? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, how about, uh, what about the new Lizzo? Uh, oh. native. <laughs> you mean her video she just came out with? Well, no, it's, uh, her, her, she has a new um, uh, agreement with Fabletics. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I didn't see, I saw an ad, I didn't see everything, mm. but you know, good for her. Yeah, it's, a, it's amazing a market, I mean, first of all. So Caleb, talk to me. Yeah, uh, just to kind of bounce off of that, I, I did see it, I saw that she announced it, um, I didn't look too much into it, but I think that it's honestly kind of amazing because she's been doing so much work to just kind of empower people that look like her and like people of all sizes, and it's sad to see how much hate she gets sometimes, but I think that her kind of standing up against this wall just allows so many individuals so you know like oh I'll just embrace themselves embrace how they feel embrace their sexy embrace everything you know so sometimes it just takes you know one two just a few people to really spark change in a large community so I'm just really happy to see that you know she's making 
garments and, you know, with people in her audiences to keep in mind. Um, mm. I think it's really important. And I think that she's going to do a lot of good things. So I'm excited. I can't wait. Right. Anybody else wants to stay? Something about so so it, the, con the conversation is not uh, it's, it's uh, Chiti. Uh, this is what um, Brianna just texted me. Uh, I think is it called Yiti or Chiti? I'm not sure. But but does anybody else have a uh, point of view about uh, fashion and you know the 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 body? Yeah, I think to Shana's point, um, I think body positivity for men and women um, is being represented a lot better now. Um, it was some feedback I got years ago, um, you know, and that's the first thing that they asked, like, do you have something, you know, for, for curvier men or women? You know, I think that was something that um, really made me think about when I'm providing a size range and am I being inclusive in that design as well? Um, but we see across the board with uh, Rihanna, um, with Savage Fenty. And if you look at the photography, you know, because it's, you know, it's a lingerie brand, you know, and the stigma that, you know, that we, you know, the, the images that we are used to seeing are not always inclusive in that, in that landscape. And she shed records by representing them in those fashion shows. But now um, when you're on those sites, it's not separated as a, big and tall section, you know, it's inclusive because it's a, it's a part of a, the whole collection. Um, the same with, um, I think with Skims, what Kim Kardashian is doing, like okay. all of these brands are, have attention to be inclusive and to represent people of every size, you know, because there is beauty in that and people should feel that way. And I think the best way to do that is to have them alongside the other collections too, because the big and tall thing for me, it kind of excludes people, you know, and then sometimes designers aren't putting the same effort that they would put to the regular collection. Um, so that was a reckoning that I think happened. Um, but when you have that range, there is a, a business effect to that, you know, because you're now you're speaking to a, even a large, um, larger amount of people that are looking for these things, but have, hard, have a hard time finding these things when they're going to shop. Um, but also that concern that they have when they buy things online, is it going to fit? Um, so giving that, you know, someone like a Lizzo, you know, th that leverage to influence her audience, you know, to see a brand that they may have not have known about, but also to use someone who is passionate about people feeling just as positive, I think is a beautiful thing to see. One thing I must say, though, the key is healthy. Mm -hmm. Whether you're really on the thin side or on the bigger side, the key is let's embrace all sizes, but let's embrace being healthy. That's the key, healthy and beautiful. Well, I think it's a great thing that there are also a lot of people that are finally seeing themselves through what is happening. And it is inspiring them to stand up and be more vocal about it and do, do also, like in, this, in, the, in the case of Kim Kardashian, you know, taking, I, 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 I sat a few weeks ago in a, in, a, in a conversation that she was having with a, with a Vogue writer where um, she spoke about how she didn't see herself um, and she was battling with that as a young girl because mm. there was no one that looked like her. No one had her body shape until Salma Hayek came into the scene. And she finally saw that there was someone that was curvy and shapely. And then Jennifer Lopez came in the scene and she was curvy. So that inspired her to start being more open about embracing her body and everything that she's doing now. You know, growing up in Puerto Rico, like I, I, I grew up in Puerto Rico, that's how women looked. You know, there was, there's, there's always been a lot of curves in Puerto Rico. And, I, and, and it was the Puerto Rican local designers that were taking care of that for Puerto Rican women because they couldn't get into the type of clothes that you could find if they came shopping to, to New York or to the US because everything was size six. So, you know, then there were designers that Donna Karen that she battled with her weight also and she created clothes that were more inclusive uh, as well as having more extended sizes. So, you know, I think that there has been um, for a long time um, 
a lot of opportunities to put this in the in the forefront like it is now because it's a reality you know everybody all over the world comes in all kinds of shapes not everybody is um size four six or even eight or ten you know there's 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 shapes more than than being overweight or not this is as body shapes period um you know in in it, in shoes is a different story because shoes are the shoe size that they are. There is wider foot, there is thinner foot, but the foot has with with time become a lot more universal with the mixes of cultures. Um, the foot has evolved and changed a lot. So there isn't so much anymore of like the American foot and the European foot or the Asian foot. Now the foot is a little more <clears throat> broad and um and and more inclusive so to speak mm -hmm. um but it it's about time that 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 fashion is not so unrealistic and yes. that and that um and that what is happening you know it is it's is i think that it is really great i think that the, um, the, 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 what has, what, what we have, are seeing in some runways, um, the kind of sexy clothes that we are seeing on, on women of all shapes and sizes. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's really great. It's really inspiring. It, it opens our, all of us as designers and, and creatives, um, uh, gives us a, diff a different perspective about how to approach design and how to approach product and all of that. I have to, I have to say, um, sort of a, from my personal perspective, is that there is still a lot to do with uh, the male uh, bigger body representation. Mm -hmm. um, I've written a book about it, uh, this whole sort of a subcultural point of view about it. But I do not see a lot of um, larger sized male models, which I think is kind of interesting that um, that's, that's been kind of, a, I see Ken nodding, nodding his head, but um, so hopefully there, there, there will be more, 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 more of that. And I'm always going to uh, target to hoping to see a larger size mannequin uh, in the menswear department, but I haven't seen that yet. So uh, I see them in the women's, women's wear department. Okay, so let's try to answer this question. I mean, the question was that um, is it uh, uh, is, is diversity in fashion reality or, or, or fantasy? I think it's reality. It's reality. You know, it's going whether... to take time, but it's reality. Well, okay. whether wh those, there were people that will never accept it. There will be designers and people in general that will never accept it. But what is great is that it is out there. It's not going to go anywhere. It's going to be, it's going to get, be getting bigger and bigger because it's a reality. And it is a beautiful reality of what we're seeing in the last few years, how people are more outspoken, how people are really representing, um, being, um, really true to who they are and um and i think that that is not going anywhere it's just going to become better and better yeah i know for myself over the years i have in the last few years i've seen more exposure for black designers than i've ever seen in my entire career of almost 40 years except for when i was really young when stephen burroughs was out and willie smith but since then, there really hasn't been that many. So I'm hopeful as, as far as that's concerned, you know. I think it's uh, definitely a reality, um, especially when we see uh, these fashion houses hiring more designers of color to be creative directors. Um, that says a lot about the organization and um, the progression that they have. Um, it was historic what Virgil did at Louis Vuitton. Um, and we saw the trajectory of that change, you know, Pierre Moss and 
um, all of these other head designers are now, they have their own brand, but becoming um, creative leaders at these big fashion houses, I think is really impactful because they bring a perspective that those departments don't think about. You know, they bring in a perspective about culture and people that you can only have someone of color there in a leadership role who has an equal footing at that table to influence that change. Um, so I believe that can only get better. Um, I think Aki brought a good point about when it comes to body positivity for men, we need to see more of that, you know, because big fashion houses, they have not invested in that, in that space yet. Um, we haven't seen um, these brands promote a lot of uh, plus size men in their, in their marketing as well. I think when in other um, industries they have, you know, we have DJ Khaled, you know, and all these other artists that are mm. on the forefront of brands like Nike and, and Jordan. But I think there's still a need, um, and especially in the fashion space, for us to embrace people of all backgrounds. But the one thing I do see is that in that creative leadership, that says a lot about the progression. Fantastic. Okay. Um... Let's, uh, we, we have about 12 minutes left. So I would love to have um, a question and answer uh, moment with, uh, with the audience. So if Brianna, you can help us uh, open, uh, open the conversation and see if there's some questions coming from there um, for us. And yes. why would you... super. I was gonna say anybody who has a question, you can put it in the chat, make sure you're putting it um, it says you to everyone, and that way Shay and I will be able to see it, and I can read the questions off to the panel. Okay, great. So while we wait for the questions, um, let me ask, um, who is your inspiration, uh, Shana? Who is my inspiration? <laughs> yeah, I know there's a lot of names probably, but like, is there one like really? Well, I don't know, there's so many. Um... Well, currently, I absolutely love Valentino. That is one of my greatest inspirations right now. Um, I'm inspired by the young people in general. Yeah. Uh, and how they, they are just like, forget what the organizations are saying. They're just breaking down doors and doing, doing it their way. Um, I love, I mean, I'm talking about all the young kids today. They, I think they are some of my greatest inspiration right now. And we have plenty of them here at CCS. <laughs> yeah, I just love yeah. them. I mean, and Instagram has changed the game completely. And they completely. just completely changed the game to the door, to the uh, gatekeepers. So I love how the kids have shown that, okay, we're doing this our way. We don't care what anybody else says. And I, I'm just inspired by it. Great. Caleb, do you have any, are you a fan of any uh, contemporary designers or historical designers that might have paved the way for, for all of us? I've been really inspired by Charles James recently. Um, mm. Yeah, especially for my, my upcoming collection I'm working on. Um, just the way that he sculpted, um, you know, the fabric and all the understructures to create his garments and create those iconic silhouettes is just so fascinating to me. Um, so I was just trying to pull different methods from that into my own, my own space, my own ideas. Um, yeah, so really, really just been inspired by um, Charles and just understructures in general. So. Super. Any names uh, come to mind, Edmundo or? I like to look at people. I get inspired by people. I mean, mm -hmm. I admire designers. Um, I admire many designers because I know what it takes to, 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 to do everything that we all do. But the real inspiration for me is, is, is people, is men, women, and, 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 mm -hmm. and this generation is very inspiring. I love that they are non-apologetic and, and they're doing what they want to do on how they want to live and 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 with all the difficulties that that comes they continue doing it and that is really inspiring i agree in every sense of the word not just aesthetically but also you know it, 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 it it's how to see life and how to um 
how to how to create for new generation and and how to also um, help other generations see it differently mm. and be part of it. Can you mention a couple of names already? Uh... Yeah, I I have a lot that I people I look up to now. A lot of them are black. You know, I will say that you know because um, to Ed Mundo's point knowing how hard it is, but to know how it is to be a black designer where you have great ideas and you're trying to, you know, make sense of it all or find the right resources. But uh, Virgil Abloh, um, he bestowed us so much wisdom. You know, if you just kind of go back to his speeches and even um, right before he passed, he had a whole scholarship program specifically for emerging black designer students. Um, and it was really, you know, impactful to see how he kind of he called it free game. Like, hey, let me just put y'all on like all these things that I learned along the way. Here's a website. Everything from like how to find a logo when you're thinking about placement on t-shirts. Um, he pretty much put a blueprint that a lot of us can follow that we would sometimes go years learning or, you know, just kind of being, you know, sometime in, in those rooms with these people to kind of guide us on that path. Um, but he made it attainable. And one thing he always said is that I'm doing this, for this, you know, for us, you know, I, you know, he said it was us at Louis Vuitton, not just me, you know, and I think that says a lot, you know, because he, he knows where he comes from, he knows the background, he knows his ancestors, and all that work and pro progress that had to happen in this country for things like that to happen. Um, but also when it comes to the actual experience I think Kirby does such a good uh, a way of that, you know, if, with Pierre Moss and to have a fashion show at uh, Madam C.J. Walker's mansion was like fire to me. Like I thought that was like the dopest thing in the world because for so long, you know, that space has never been used for something of that magnitude. So knowing that when it comes to the creative expression of our art, um, to look at designers like that, that know no bounds, that didn't just do a typical fashion show. Um, you start to think about like, wow, what was that conversation like? You know, where did he, you know, who did he reach out to to get that done? Um, and I think so many, so many things that we have in our minds, they don't feel attainable until we see someone like us do it. Something beautiful about Virgil that was very inspiring too, you know, coming from the times of fashion when it was about being a diva and designers had to be divas. And um, I knew designers too that, that, behaved in a certain way because it was expected from them to, to behave in a certain way. It, it, Virgil brought everything down to earth, to earth. You know, you could tell how genuine he was working from one of the most luxurious houses and how he spoke, what he said was so from the heart and so who he was as a person and not who, who he was expected to be to be mm -hmm. from the industry, which is an industry that puts a lot of expectations on people, or we like to think that it's expected of, of us to, to be in a certain way. So he broke all of that. And we're seeing more and more and more of that genuine humanity from designers, from the new generation of designers today. Right. Nikki, I will give you the last uh, opportunity to close um, the panel. Oh, um, I guess I do look back into the pioneers of like the anti-fashion movement back in you know the late '80s, beginning of '90s. Uh, for example, like you know Ray Kawakubo, Yoji Yamamoto, anyone that you know, the Antwerp Six. Um, I think without them, I don't think fashion would be the way it is today. Um, they really, especially Rei Kaokuba, Yoji Yamamoto, mm -hmm. they never cared. They are tunnel visioners, if that makes any sense. Um, they don't listen to the outside world. And somehow, even today, after many, many decades, it's still timeless and it's still respectable as a design. And for me, I take a lot of inspiration of how did they have that mindset of be, let's let's do this one thing and one thing only, and it's still effective today. Um, and on top of that, I think um, as Edmundo said, he does look at like real people for inspiration. I think that really resonates a lot to me because the whole reason I became interested in clothes and styles is because moving around a lot, like traveling a lot as a younger kid, you see 
the differences between people who are in first class and economy. <laughs> um, <laughs> and you see you women that still wears, you know, white t-shirt, a, a jean and just a bag. And you don't, you, you don't even know what ticket they have. You could, you could tell from a mile away that they're first class. And something about that, something about how, it's not about the clothing itself. It's about how someone carries around themselves. You could sort of see what their life is like behind all, all the clothing. Um, I think that's what's really inspiring to me. So airport fashion really is important to me. <laughs> um, yeah. So I, I would love for you to become airport fashion police. Oh yeah, I would love it. There is, there's a lot that should not be happening. Oh, exactly. Outside of it, people's was shocking. Houses. it was shocking when I first moved to America. You know, people are carrying around pillows. <laughs> it's going to be a Victor and Rolf look. Thank you so much, uh, the panelists. I really, really appreciate your insight. And I feel like um, it is the reality and we have a very, very beautiful, positive future. So uh, warmest, warmest thank yous to all of you. And audience, also don't forget that we have our fashion show tonight at 8 p.m. live streaming straight from Detroit. So please join us there. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. Bye.